Hello and a warm welcome to the Refreshing Views Observatory. For those of you new here, my name is Mark Radici. So today we're going to do probably the simplest form of astrophotography. It's so simple, even I can do it. We're going to set our cameras up, we're going to automatically capture a sequence of images. We can then process these into a video, into a time lapse, showing the beauty and splendour of the Milky Way. And then we're going to stack a number of those images together and produce a single print that we can then display. So last month, my friend and I from my astronomy club, Basingstoke Astronomy Club, we went up to the beautiful island of Tenerife. And you can see that in this video up here. And I spent, every time I set up my telescope, I'd also set the camera up and just record that beauty of the night sky. So that's why I'm going to show you how I did that in this video. So there's many ways to do this. This is just my way. So feel free to adapt, to tailor what I'm telling you here to your own setup, to your own camera, to your own sky conditions. So this is my setup. It's simple but effective. It's a bit like me. And the first thing you'll notice is that I am not using a star tracker. Now, of course, when you take pictures of the night sky, what you're going to see is that the stars slowly move across the field of view. So this is why people use a star tracker. You can take a longer duration picture before those pictures, the stars start to trail. But of course, that's more kit to carry. It's more expensive. So I like to use take my shots. I just use a, literally a static tripod. And I need to use the software to stack a series of short images together and still produce that good result, that good signal to noise ratio for a nice sharp image. So regardless of whether you're taking long duration pictures on a tracker or short duration pictures like this on a static tripod, the process is broadly the same. So as you can imagine, the heart of the setup is the camera. And broadly speaking, you can use any camera for this, but it's got to have the capability of taking a long duration picture. So starlight in, inherently is quite faint. The Milky Way is inherently quite faint. So you need that long duration picture for the signal to build up. So obviously if we've got the camera, the next thing we need to use is the lens. Now this is my lens. This is a Samyang 14 millimeter f2.8 and it gets this beautiful 90 degree field of view. This is quite affordable. And as you can see, it's got this massive lens on the front. It lets all this light through. So it's beautiful for capturing the faint, faint details in the Milky Way. You certainly don't need a big lens like this. Certainly when I was starting out, I used the stock lens that the, the camera came with, the 18 to 55 millimeter. And I just had it at the shortest focal length at 18 millimeters and at the widest setting. So don't think you need to have a dedicated astronomy lens or a dedicated wide field of view lens. You can just use the stock lens if you wish. So the next item we're going to need is a sturdy tripod. This is going to hold the camera, it's going to hold the camera stably while the stars move in front of the field of view. So like anything you pay for what you get. Um, I was actually quite lucky I scored this second hand for £20 from Cash Converters. This is a Sherpa Velbon tripod and it seems to do the job. It's very light, very stable. So again, hunt around, see if you can find a bargain, but make sure it's really stable. You don't want a flimsy uh, tripod while you're trying to hold the camera steady to take these pictures of the stars. And finally we're going to need an intervalometer. Now this device, they're quite reasonably priced, you can get these from the ordinary online stores and this controls the camera. When the camera is set to bulb mode this controls the camera and it will take a series of pictures for the duration that we programmed in, one after the other, for as many as we want to tell it to do. My camera actually has a built-in intervalometer so I don't actually need this for my camera. Now we'll go through the settings later on, but my advice is to have a good play with the camera before you go outside, before you're in the dark, before you're in the cold, covered in dew. Get used to setting the exposure, the F ratio, adjusting the focus. Now this can be a deal breaker in our damp climate and that is dew. So this is when the lens cools below the dew point and you get the mist, the water vapor forming on front of the lens. And it basically makes the lens unusable while it's got that fog of uh, water on the front of it. So what we can do is we can buy little heaters and a power pack and we can plug the two together. And that basically just gently warms the lens, just keeps it a few degrees above the dew point and keeps the lens dew free. I have seen other people where they buy those little hand warmers, chemical hand waters, hand warmers, put that on the lens and that as well also you know with a little scrunchie or a, an elastic band so the darker the sky the better our pictures are going to be so there's two things we need to be careful of one is getting away from light pollution we want to be outside of the city ideally in a rural location and even here in rural Wiltshire we still get loads of light pollution from army camps you know government buildings churches businesses they've all closed they've all gone everyone's gone home yet they still leave all the lights on in the middle of the night so all that light is just going to fog up your lens it's going to drown out the milky way so we want to avoid that as far as possible 
And the other thing to consider is of course the moon. So a little bit of moonlight is not going to hurt the image, but we definitely don't really want to be trying to capture the Milky Way e a week either side of full moon. So try and be around sort of first quarter to last quarter. That being said, it's pretty good fun trying to capture a crescent moon, trying to capture the uh, moon as it rises or sets in the crescent phase. That can be quite pretty. So I'm fairly simple with my kind of shots in the summer. I'm going to point towards the core of the summer Milky Way. That's where all the action is. That's all the bright nebulosity, the dust length, the beauty of the Milky Way galaxy. Conversely, in the winter, we're facing away. The Earth is facing out away from the core of the galaxy and we're looking out into the depths of the Milky Way. And at this time of year, then I will look towards the bright stars of Orion, the Seven Sisters, the Hyades star cluster. So Orion, surrounding regions in the winter, summer Milky Way, that spring to autumn time. So the other thing I try and do is try and put something interesting in the foreground. Now I don't profess to be any sort of landscape photographer, but having something in the foreground can make it a bit more interesting. So let's go outside and do some shooting. It's a few other things as well. Don't forget, most important of all, check you've got your memory card in the camera before you go. Check you've got freshly charged battery. So we're outside now under a beautiful clear night. We're away from all the street lights. We've avoided the bright lights of the moon and we're ready to photograph the stars. So this is a Canon camera. It doesn't really matter which camera you've got. They're all broadly the same. We're going to set the camera mode to manual, to M for manual. And then we're going to try and focus. Now to do that, we've got to be able to detect a star. So put the ISO up nice and high towards one of the highest settings and try and line up in the viewfinder with a star. Now you can't autofocus, the stars are too faint uh, for the autofocus to work. So we're going to have to do this manually. Put the live view screen on and try and find the star in the field of view. Once you've got that little dot there, we're gonna zoom in, we're gonna magnify that image, and then we're gonna use the focus, we're gonna set the focus to manual, focus manually, to make that star down to a fine point. Now you want to do this on a bright star, the crescent moon, uh, Jupiter. I per personally prefer using Jupiter just because one is by far brighter than any other star. And also when you're right at critical focus, you do get to see the little Jovian moons as well. So you know you're precisely at focus. If you can't find a star, try focusing on a, on a distant street light that's somewhere in the distance uh, or take a test shot. Take a test shot, see what the field of view looks like, and then at least you know where to zoom in on the live screen view. Live screen view. Now the next point is that the stars will slowly move across the field of view as the as the Earth rotates underneath. So what we're going to use is the photographer's 500 rule. So take 500 and divide it by the focal length of your lens. So I've got my 40 uh, millimeter Samyang. 500 divided by 14 is 36. And what we need to do then is take into the fact that this is a crop sensor. It's not a full size 35 millimeter sensor. So look up your crop sensor of your, sorry, your crop factor of your lens. And then we apply that. And that brings that down for me, in my case, to 22 seconds. So let's call that 20 seconds for round numbers. You can go a bit longer. Uh, you'll get a little bit of trailing. You can go shorter. You'll get obviously less trailing. But of course, you're then gathering less light in that exposure. Now, the next thing to do is choose your F ratio. And again, this is the measure of the aperture of the lens. Now, if you leave the lens wide open, you gather loads of lights. You get a nice good build up of picture on the sensor. The downside is this is where the aberrations lie. So some people do adjust their F ratios, just stop it down a couple of stops to try and give it a nicer, cleaner image. Right, so the next thing to do is to select your ISO. Now this is the gain, this is the amplification, the electronic amplification that the sensor applies to the image that's coming in. And again, this involves a lot of debate and a bit of judgment. So really we want, if we had a nice high ISO, you would get loads of signal, loads of image building up. But this is where the noise lies. This is where you get electronic noise building up. So if you go too far, you don't get such a nice image. Now we're going to stack our pictures together using some free software, using the, free, the freeware, and that'll help reduce that noise. So I always recommend doing a two or three test shots, see what effect you have depending on the sky conditions. So when I'm at home, in a relatively rural in the village skies, I can have an ISO of 1600. Any more than that, and it starts to, to, to glow out a bit. There's too much background uh, light in the sky. However, when we're on the dark skies of Tenerife, high up on the, that desert plateau above the light pollution, I can actually go to ISO 6400 and not have too bad an effect at skies with that much darker. So a few other points I like to shoot in RAW and JPEG. So RAW is the uncompressed data straight off the sensor. Uh, and JPEG is obviously being compressed, so you've got a much smaller file size. 
And so we've got the original data if you ever want to go back to it, and we'll use that to stack our nice sharp shot at the end. And we've got the JPEGs ready to actually put into the time lapse. We'll set white balance to daylight. Of course, starlight really is sunlight daylight, it's just much further away. And the most important of all, you must turn your flash off. Of course, flash is not going to make any difference on the landscape, it's too far away and it's certainly not going to light up the Milky Way. But you will get a lot of shouting if you set your flash off on a dark sky where you've got other observers with you. Turn your image stabilisation off, we don't need that, that's what the tripod is for. Now, if you don't have an intervalometer, if you haven't set one up, then just put the shutter delay on to two seconds. And when you press the button manually, at least that gives two seconds for the camera vibrations, the vibrations from your hand to die away. Now, the other thing to do, and I always forget to do this, is to take some darts. So this is a way the software will subtract some of that electronic noise off the sensor. So what we're going to do is put the dust cap on, and we are going to take a number of shots, about 10 or 20, with the same camera settings. So literally dust cap on, same camera settings, 20 seconds, same ISO, same uh, white balance. And the software will then use that data to subtract noise from the image. I invariably end up forgetting to do this. I'm normally half asleep because it's the middle of the night. Uh, and I don't really seem to suffer too badly from it, but it's something that's worth doing. Okay, so we're fully set up. We've got the camera mounted. We've got the settings dialed in. We've done a few test shots so we know we're in the right place. And this is really the easy bit. Once you've got that focus dialed in, I just literally leave the camera running. So as you can see from the background, I'm not in my shed. This is the joys of working away from home and I'm staying in my hotel room, but rather than waste the time just sitting behind the bar, sorry, sitting, propping up the bar, I thought I'd quickly show you how to process those the, the pictures we took the other day. So let's open them up. So here are all the frames we captured and we started off at dusk with the satellites whizzing past. So that's dusk, that's the last shots. And as it gets darker, as darkness comes along, then the Milky Way starts appearing. So there's the Milky Way now rising above the mountains as, as the sky gets dark. You can still see that it's not quite, quite dark. But if we zoom in, we'll see what we see. So the stars aren't too bad. They're not too, too distorted by the trailing of the Earth's rotation. But you can see here we get this sort of very noisy effect. It looks like someone sprinkled salt and pepper all over the video file over the background sort of haze. It's not a smooth, nice, milky white texture. And that is literally the noise from pushing the ISO. We got the exposure right. We're not particularly trailing, although the stars are somewhat distorted you know, down here, but not too bad. The other thing to be aware of is that we were at f2.8. So the lens was wide open. We let loads of light in. We caught all that faint, faint dust and nebulosity in the Milky Way. However, by being at f2.8, we therefore have distorted stars. And if I zoom in, you'll see what I mean, where you've got this sort of little flaring region. A little star cluster there. So you get this little flaring region off to one side, just because we were wide open. If I'd stopped it down to f4, we'd got much sharper, sharper stars, uh, but we were therefore would have had to got less signal in. So again, there's always a trade-off. And of course, if I've been tracking, if I could say done a two minutes exposure at F4, again, that would have solved that problem. But that means I then need a star tracker and that's more kit and more stuff to carry. So what we're going to do is we're going to stack them. We're going to stack, say, 10 or 14, one on top of the other. And the noise, the electronic noise on the sensor will average out and then the signal will amplify. So we'll reduce that salt and pepper effect. So we're going to open up a piece of freeware called Sequator, or Sequator, however you pronounce it. And we're going to load up our star images. So here we are then. So we're in the Milky Way rising. I don't want to do these first ones because it was still dusk then, so we want to have proper dark Milky Way. So I don't know, we'll do it. What's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fourteen. Let's call that 17 pictures. So we've opened them all up. They're in there. It's taken a base image, so don't forget, of course, that the stars, the first image and the last image, the stars have moved between the two. And it says I'm going to average them out and superimpose that onto the base image for the foreground. Now, if I'd remembered, but I forgot, you can put your darks in there and you can do your flats. I, through sheer laziness, didn't. So we'll set the output. 
and we will call that Milky Way Rising for YouTube, and that's in the Milky Way Rising folder. So we'll save that. Now, what I want to do is make this click on this. So we're turning it to align stars. We definitely don't want star trails, and we'll do the accumulation. We'll select the best pixels, and we'll move that all the way to the right to strict. I'm going to go to the sky region now because I deliberately photographed with this mountain in front and I'll come back to that why that's important shortly it's telling me to fill the sky with brush now if I had a nice easy horizon if you were looking out over the coast or over the fields and you had a straight horizon you could use the the, the boundary line and then you set a line or a gradient where you set you know if there's a haze or something but we haven't got an irregular mask that says fill the sky with the brush you get this blue circle and if I use the the, the if I use the mouse wheel, scroll back and forth, the blue circle changes size. So I'm going to fill this up with sky. So this is all sky. Make sure you get all of it down to there. Don't forget that bit. And just do these bits around here. I'm not too sure how strict you have to be near the horizon where the software does tell the difference between fixed dark and moving sky but I try and do it as accurately as I can Dunk into those little gaps Dunk down there Dunk into the, down to the little rocky outcrops so we fill the sky with well, that we've painted the sky we've selected our images if we had noise and vignetting we would add them and I've just noticed when I looked at that I hadn't select freeze the ground and then I'm just going to go start and while that's doing there I'm just going to open up one of our files so yeah there you are you can see all the temporary files starting to appear what was our base image is 9707 so let's open up 9707 so there's 9707 I should have mentioned that's literally the only thing I do on um, on this side is the align stars, the best pixels, and then paint the sky. I leave everything else off. If I want to change anything else, we can always do that in Photoshop afterwards. So what I want to do then, let's open that up. So that's Milky Way Rising for YouTube. Let's put you on the left there, and then we'll put 9707 on there right so if i look down here this is the scorpion this is the sting of the scorpius as it comes up there and i'm going to zoom in to these two open clusters i'll try and zoom in to these two open clusters now this is messier 6 and messier 7 they're really beautiful clusters uh, quite visible and you can see obviously visible to the naked eye as well in that sky and we'll get about the same image scale, perfect. So now we're looking at that to get a bit more. So I've zoomed right in, what am I now? Sort of 200%, 214%, so we're right down into the detail. And you can see there, with this high magnification, the stars are slightly trailed, not badly so, I certainly couldn't see it looking at the original size on the laptop screen, but obviously inevitably trailed. Well, what's very apparent if I look at the original single frame is it, yeah, it got this grainy texture, it's like sand or pepper, and how much smoother that is on this side, and that's from 17 frames. It probably would look a bit better if we'd had the darks on there as well, but I'm not, I'm quite pleased with that. I think that's done come out quite well. You know, look at that, all this sort of like lines coming through it, and then completely smooth on this side. And that literally is the noise is averaged out you know as the noise naturally fluctuates around so the noise is averaged to a constant level and of course the signal has stacked up more and more and more which is why we stack frames and get rid of that noise so that's the difference there so what i'm going to do then let's go back and let's open this in potato chop so i'm inherently lazy when it comes to processing my images people spend hours uh, doing all this fine detail. I really don't bother. This is just to record a nice landscape shot. Uh, so let's just have a look there. And I've got a few little tips just to do that. Here comes the picture now. So the first thing I need to do is duplicate my layer. 
so I still have the original data. Let's get that to fit on the screen, there we are. So let's have a look around the screen then. So there is probably the brightest patch of the Milky Way around here. So this is M24, if I remember rightly, the Sagittarius star cloud. I'm going to do that, let's press Control M. And when you press that, if you notice, it automatically goes to the dropper tool. This is where you sample the picture. And I'm going to come along here to the brightest patch of the Milky Way, which I think is getting about there. And I'm going to click the little hand. And then with the mouse, see here as we're going along, it's a bit about there, maybe a little bit more. There's a nice bright patch. Yeah, it's getting about there. And then hold the mouse button down. And we can slide that, oops, move the wrong way, not that much, that's too much. Just want to do it a little bit. And I'm going to do the same over here, nice dark patch, nice dark lane. And let's just drag that down ever so slightly. So this is called an S curve. If you see there, that's just turned into a very gentle S. So that you can see there just that little boosting contrast. Now this is the sky glare, this might be light pollution from one of the towns that are a few miles away. But you can see there just that, that how much brighter that has appeared. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go File Open. Now if you remember we left the tripod exactly where it was. We started at dusk and then we finished whatever it was an hour or so later to record that time lapse. So let's open up Milky Way Rising and we'll go to our first picture. And I'm going to go Control A, Control C. I'm going to paste that on top. So if I turn that layer off, you will see it's the same picture, just taken at a different time of the day. Same setting, same picture. And what I want to do is combine that red mountain, that sunset mountain, with the Milky Way. So you, obviously you can't see that in the original picture. So what we'll do, layer, mask, hide all, and you see there you've got this black screen, and if we paint it in white with a paintbrush, and we'll make that a little bigger. Now if I remember rightly, we use the square brackets to make things bigger and smaller. Oops, a bit too big. I'm at 100% opacity, normal mode, and we can literally just yeah, see I went too far there, so we'll have to invert it if you go too far. Just paint it back in black. There we go. Straight away there you can see the difference and what we can do is clone out if you wanted to. Get me that a bit bigger. Out click there. Oh, we're on the wrong mode, aren't we? There we are. We're on the right layer. I'll just click there. So I then end up doing ever more finer and finer paintbrushes just to get into there. So that is how I take a photograph of the night sky without a star tracker. I stack the images together and then because I took a shot at dusk, in the foreground with the with the foreground with that mountain i can then combine the two together and then produce a nice smooth image so i mentioned earlier that we're going to use freeware to stack our images so the program we want to download is virtual dub and i use this for my milky way shots i use this for my planetary images as well so let's open that up so we're going to tell it to go file open video file now there's a little shortcut down here, sorry, a little tick box called automatically load link segments. And because all the images were saved by the camera in their number order, that's their default approach. They're therefore uh, 377, 9378, 9379, and so on. If I click on one of them, it actually opens all of them, 339, 339 images captured using that intervalometer, using the time lapse I just left it unlimited, went off observing and that's what it caught. So as you can see here I've boosted the ISO to give a more dramatic appearance and you can see here we're looking at one-to-one -one scale now so you can see we've got this sort of 
I don't know, salt and pepper sort of effect, you know, this sort of peppery background. And that's the electronic noise, that's what we were talking about earlier. So we're not so fussed about that for a time lapse. Quite conscious that we're if you make a time lapse at the one to one resolution, it'll be massive and won't necessarily fit on the screen. So the first thing we're going to do is add a filter. Add, and I'm going to resize the image and we'll break it down to the conventional 1920 by 1280. So that's the sort of standard sort of computer size pixels. You can choose whatever size you want, whatever percentage you want, and we'll OK that. The other thing to do is do a frame rate video frame rate. And we've got 339 images. So if we did that at 10 seconds, 10 frames per second, that'd be 30 seconds long. We can go a bit faster than that, so we'll get to 20. But again, you can use this at whatever speed you like. Let's OK that. Then we'll get File, Save as an AVI, Milky Way Rising. We'll call it Milky Way Rising for YouTube. Either a satellite or a plane or something like that going past. It must be a satellite where it faded. Uh, so yeah, so this is the point where I go and make a cup of tea because this is predicted to take six and a half minutes. So we're nearing the end now. What have we got? Three minutes ago, got another minute ago, but I've just noticed that the coat hanger cluster is crawling past the field of view. So that's always a beautiful sight in your binoculars. But looking at this image there, you can really see that sort of cloudy effect just from pushing the ISO. And again, when we compress that down, down to a 1920, that effect won't be so apparent. You can also see that the stars, because I had the F ratio, because I had the F ratio wide open, I was at F 2.8, you can see the stars aren't quite perfect points. You've got this flaring off to the side. If I'd gone to F4, we wouldn't have got such a bright picture, but we would have had sharper stars. But you can see by keeping the exposure at 20 seconds, we actually have, by and large, nearly round stars, a slight elongation, but certainly nothing to worry about. So there we are. Right, so let's go to the video location. So Milky Way rising for YouTube. So there we have it. Look at all those satellites whizzing across. So 20 frames per second, look at that Milky Way rising, glorious. Absolutely wonderful. You see the stars aren't quite round up there. No, that's not looking too bad. Absolutely wonderful. Right, so that's how, that's how you make a time lapse of the Milky Way rising. So I hope you found that useful. If you've got any questions or comments, then put them in the discussion below. And as always, don't forget to subscribe and I'll bring you more videos as we explore the night sky. So I also use Virtual Dove for my planetary images. It's exactly the same approach. And the other night I went out and imaged Jupiter and I took pictures every few minutes, a video capture every few minutes. Uh, there we are, there's my sharpened pictures. So 2.20 in the morning, 2.20 in the morning. Uh, there's a great red spot and that is Io if I remember rightly. I took a picture of 23, so it's every three minutes I have two minute video capture, one minute uh, just to let it rotate. And you can see Io then coming off the disc. And yeah, 301, yes I remember that, the, sh the seeing was just perfect at this point, 301, you can see all those fine details there. And so let's open Virtual Dub again. So we're going to go File, Open Video File. So be aware then, just having tried that, Virtual Dub doesn't allow you to use TIFFs. So I've just saved all mine as JPEGs. There we go. So there's the first video. What I'm going to have to do, of course, is remove that resizing filter. So let's delete that. I don't want to reduce these anymore. And I'm going to go Video. Frame rates, 16 frames, I don't know, let's do a three frames per second. You can put whatever frame rate you like in it and we'll just go file, save as I, AVI, new images, Jupiter, time lapse for YouTube, save. And that was only a handful of frames, much smaller video size, obviously. So let's go to Jupiter, time lapse for YouTube. There's the great red spot, there goes IO, there goes the sharp frame. Glorious. 
So yeah, using that same bit of software, you can do Milky Way stacks, you can do Jupiter rotating, whatever you want to make a time-lapse of.